All right, I am here with John Caldwell, and he is the founder of Three Victor. How's it going, John? Doing great, thanks. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm excited to unpack uh, your history here. Before we get into your successes, let's talk about your background. What got you into business and entrepreneurship from the start? Yeah, so the quick version is that my dad was an entrepreneur, and so I knew from an early age that it was possible to kind of create your own lifestyle and, and whatever you want through, through business. So that was always in the back of my mind. Um, I did a bit of a detour after high school and went into the Army. So I served for four years in the Canadian Army and um, went to Afghanistan, did the shooting team, all that. But I was always interested in technology and business, and so I was always reading books while I was deployed and while I was in training about those kinds of things. And um, yeah, so I, I, you know, when I got back and I got out of the Army in 2013, I was looking for my next adventure and I got started in um, technology sales and uh, yeah, and today I'm a father of three, traveling around the world uh, as a uh, homeschooling slash world schooling family. And we're right, uh, right now we're in Mexico, so we're just uh, nice. going around the world and having a lot of fun. Nice. Right before we started recording, we were talking about world schooling. So for anybody listening to this, that is like one of the coolest words I've heard in a while. <laughs> I'd never heard of it before, uh, and we could talk forever about it. But I want to make sure that we dig into your your businesses. Of course. Let's talk a little bit about what, what, what that first venture was, what types of things you were tracking, and how you kind of scaled that. Yeah, so the gist of it is uh, I got out of the Army in 2013, and I had no transferable skills. I knew I wanted to get into business, but I figured I probably wasn't ready to start my own thing, and I, I felt like I needed some, some additional skills. So I had always been aware that sales and marketing was kind of foundational to any business that you were going to do. So I got a job as uh, an SDR, like just doing uh, cold calls and cold emails for a um, like really well-funded uh, technology or hardware uh, sensor startup out of Quebec. And I uh, started doing that and I got some you know, accounts with Apple and Google and just you know, like I built kind of an outbound process there. Um, but while I was doing this, that part was interesting, but I really didn't like the actual cold calling itself and I was kind of, you know, kept daydreaming about starting my own business. And so I just suddenly quit and I started an e-com business that I had uh, been thinking about for some time. Uh, I called it Bonnie and Clyde Pet Goods. Um, used all my remaining savings and some loans uh, in Canada. There's uh, really good um, programs for starting entrepreneurs. And I just uh, did an analysis of the market and thought about, you know, what kind of industry do I think is recession proof, has good margins, is going to grow well over the next decade or so. And I picked the pet industry. And then within that, I did some research and uh, found that supplements were nice because they had low minimum orders with manufacturers. So I could get started without needing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that there seemed to be a bit of a niche uh, or like a gap in the market for really high end supplements with really high quality ingredients. And so that's how I positioned everything around the, the business. Cool. Very cool. And when you got started, you know, what were, what type of team did you have? Did you hire immediately? Did you just do it by yourself for a little while? What can you tell us about the, the, the team? Yeah, so I was uh, solo just with a couple of freelancers that I contracted with for the brand design. Um, despite being like really more of a salesperson at the start, I knew that having a strong brand was critical for if we were going to try to position ourselves as a premium uh, product in the category, I knew that we had to look really, really sharp. So I spent quite a bit of money on, uh, on that. Well, well, for me at the time, what was quite a bit of money is like $2,000 on a whole brand package, which now I realize is like actually really re very reasonable. But we got, a, we got lucky. We got a, a freelancer who was really talented and at the start of his freelancing career, he just left an agency. And very, very, very talented guy made some uh, really good logos and designs for us. Cool. Very cool. And what were some KPIs? Like what, what were some things that you guys were tracking? Obviously there's sales, of course, as a, as a, um, uh, e-commerce company, but w what can you share around like types of KPIs you guys were, were focusing on? So the two main ones early on that I was focused on when we were just e-commerce, because we eventually branched into retail, um, but we started out just on Amazon. And I figured I want to go where the traffic is and just do a quick, and this is when Amazon FBA was really kind of kicking off back in like 2014, mm -hmm. 2015, where it was really, really popular. So we launched on there. And then the first thing I was testing was conversion rate. So mm -hmm. I, I had a spreadsheet where I had different prices. I wasn't sure what the price the product at. So I started out way too high. I, I priced like double what the market was paying. And I found that you know, I wasn't getting any conversions, so I kept scaling it back by, uh, well, I, I bumped it all the way down to $20, and then I did a $1, $1 price increase every week. And the traffic was relatively steady. It was interesting, I was getting roughly the same amount of traffic every day on Amazon, and I just tracked week to week what the conversion rate was at at different prices. I didn't change product photos, titles, anything. I didn't split test anything else. And I did that for a period of about a month and a half, tried six different price points. 
and I was testing the conversion rate on the listing and the average revenue per day and then gross margin per day at that price point. Mm -hmm. And I found it was really crazy. I found that a price that was like 30 to 35% higher than the market was actually converting more. It was converting at 40% on the listing and we were generating, I think it was like 50% more revenue and more gross profit per day because we were just selling so many more units at that price point. Very cool, very cool. And Amazon is so brilliant in that you're, you're getting into like a stream of traffic, like there's distribution baked in. And exactly. I think it's such a, a beautiful thing to get started in business when distribution is there, like you're just tapping into already you know, a, a traffic of people looking for things. So it's a great, like kind of a fire hose way to start business. And, you know, if you do a traditional like Shopify or something like that, you really have to fight to get distribution in different ways. Well, e either that, or you need to have a big budget for uh, ad testing, right? You yeah. have like five to 10 grand to throw into meta or TikTok or whatever, just mm -hmm. to see if your product gets, and then even then you're still gonna have a lot of questions around, you know, is it the layout of my page? Is it, is it the product? Is it the price? You have no idea. Whereas on Amazon, you have so many comparable, there's so many competitors and you know they have the best practices for CRO that you know, like for conversion rate optimization, you know that if it's not selling, it's something wrong with you. It's not wrong. It's not something wrong with Amazon setup, right? So mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I think marketplaces are a killer way to launch and to get some initial validation. I always advise founders though, like use it, but just be aware of the concentration risk and have a, have a plan to get on different channels once you validate your idea, you know? Mm-hmm. And the, the way that you did it was smart in testing with price points because a lot of times I like to compare it to like reading a book on surfing. Like you, you, you can read and research and watch videos as much as you want, yeah. but until you're on there and you get the taste of like what customers are saying and you, 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 you don't know until you do it. So just doing it is like the educational curve uh, component there. So I really like that you did a, it was a dollar a day over what, what frame time frame again? It was two weeks. It was, it was a dollar a week roughly. And okay. so I started it at like 1995 and then a week later it was at 2195. And then a week later it was like 22 or 2395. I just kept bumping it up until cool. I settled on 2895 was like the sweet spot where I made like way more profit and way more revenue. Uh, Cause I knew that volume on the listing was critical too. It was really ironic is it's at a higher price point. Like it was selling more units per day at the higher price point than the lower one. And mm -hmm. so now when I work with founders like in, in technology, which is like my main career now, I always advise them, let's start with pricing first. That's, that's the biggest lever that we can play with. And, and I, I think that's one of the things that's probably most, Alex Formosi talks about this a lot. It's one of the main levers that he plays with, with new businesses that he buys. And I think it's really underutilized these days. Yeah, 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 well said. And I, I like the, the mindset of um, if, in, if, when you're operating a business, thinking about if someone were to come in and just brute force this business, what would the first few things they would do be? <laughs> and, yeah. it, and it like kind of, it helps you realize that pricing is usually that first one that somebody bullish comes in and says like, we're raising our prices. That's uh, it. It was, it's a private equity playbook, right? Raise prices, cut off X by 20 to 50%, right? Laying off people, automating, installing software, whatever, cutting bloat. And then that's like their model for creating margin expansion and then, you know, multiple expansion, right? So, so yeah. So let's talk about the timeline of, of this business. Like you, you did a great job testing pricing. You kind of landed at a, at a higher tier price point. Uh, how long did you kind of scale up the business? Did you add SKUs and then what, what kind of led to the, the initial exit conversations? Yeah. So one of the things, um, I think this is like, Part of my success, but also probably a mistake for most businesses, was that once I had initial success with the one SKU, my thinking was, okay, I have a proven product and I'm more of a direct seller. Like it's easier for me to pick up the phone and talk to 50 random people than it is for me to build a whole marketing campaign. At least at the time it was. Now I have a lot more experience doing that. But back then it was just a lot easier for me to like brute force my way into a market. So my thinking was, okay, I got this proven product online, let's take it to retail. And so I started cold calling distributors in Canada to try and uh, secure someone who was willing to give me a shot and launch this product into retail. Now, looking back, it would have been a lot better to just stay online for a couple of years, build out our SKUs, and then go to market where you can pick up more shelf space. Mm -hmm. But I was just eager to just get going. I was super impatient. So I uh, started cold calling people like that. Um, and then in parallel, I also applied for a TV show in Canada called Dragon's Den, which is, um, it's basically it was like the Dragon's Den show, I think it started out in the UK and then they launched it in Canada. 
And it's what inspired Shark Tank in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in the States, right? So it's like a very similar format. You just go up and pitch to five investors. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went, we got accepted, went on that show. That was really, a, that was a riot. That was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so in parallel to that, I was telling people, hey, we're going to be on Dragon's Den. So it's kind of like this extra credibility status boosting thing, right? Like, yes, we're a new brand, but we're going to get the Dragon's Den uh, bump effect, right, in retail. So people are going to be looking for the product, so help us sell it. And then that really helped us um, get distributors. And so that took about four months, just cold calling, follow-ups, conferences. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got our second distributor after that. And then that was in 2016, 2017. Um, we added another SKU, so a smaller bottle, right, at a lower price point. And then we launched another a joint supplement um, later on. We started with a fish oil supplement for like coat, uh, skin and coat health. And then we launched a joint supplement for uh, you know, older dogs with arthritis and, and joint pain, right? Um, and then, yeah, when we sold the company in 2019, it was at, um, we have 450 stores that were distributing the product and uh, we're selling also online. And then we also had a distributor in Singapore that had randomly found us and you know, imported uh, a couple pallets of products. So that was pretty fun. Nice, nice. And the, the exit itself, let's sort of unpack that. What was that process like? You know, how long did it take and who was the, the company that, that approached you? Yeah, so before the, uh, the exit, um, I, had, uh, um, I had met this guy that ran a pet store that then moved into distribution. And he called me out of the blue because at this point, I wasn't working full time. It was still a side business. I'd gone full time on it and then I like mm -hmm. overbought inventory. So this is when, like, one of my big mistakes was I bought way too much inventory before Dragon's Den, before the episode aired. And I literally just ran out of cash waiting for the episode to air to, to clear out our inventory. So I was sitting on like 80 grand of inventory just waiting. And I was like running out of money every month. We, and I was calling the producer like, hey, are we, uh, are we slated for the next, next week? Oh yeah, it's coming, it's coming. And it ended up airing like three months later. So uh -huh. I, at that time I'd had to go get a job to pay the bills, right? So um, during that time, I'd met this guy and his name was Mark, really, really nice guy. And he, uh, he had moved up, uh, you know, he sold his pet stores and then got into distribution. And I was working full time at this, uh, this software company doing uh, uh, basically sales, right? Just like uh, as an account exec and running the business at night and like I'd take time off to go to trade shows and stuff. So it was really, it was a lot of hours, right? It was pretty crazy. Um, and then finally the business had gotten profitable enough. Like I'd sold through all the inventory, uh, things were working well about, uh, you know, 10 to 12 months after the, the episode aired, like we had a big bump and then stores like just kind of blew up after that. And uh, I was like, okay, like we're secure enough that I can take enough of a salary from the business. So I was planning on leaving and I had gone also and secured additional funding from my investors. I had these investors um, after Dragon's Den, I had other guys that came in that bought uh, about 40, 45% of the company. And they were like, hey, we're ready to fund more products and more marketing because we see the trajectory and we just want to like pour gasoline on this and, and yeah. go like crazy. And then out of the blue, I get a call from Mark, the guy from the pet store that said, hey, um, I know a guy that's rolling up pet nutrition companies in Canada. Are you interested in, in selling maybe? It's like, well, I wasn't really looking for it, but let's have a conversation and just went from there, you know? And that's how things got started really. Cool, very cool. And the, the investors that own like 45%, um, the roll up begins and was it, how many, how many companies were in the, the roll up um, that, that, were, that were already before there? Before the yeah, so there was like a parent company that was like the financial, um, like the, the, the portfolio, um, whatever lead company of the Holdco. And then there was like two other subsidiaries that were, one was for the food side, one was for the supplement side. And they needed someone to run the supplement division. They had two other brands in there. They're like, you're gonna be our third brand, but we want you to be the leader of this division. And um, so that's what a lot of the discussion was around. They're like, you get to keep doing everything that you're doing right now, like that you're doing full time for your own brand, but you get to do it with two other brands at the helm and build kind of like cross promotion and um, with you know a big budget and a big company backing you to like finance all these like other you know growth initiatives, and um, yeah, so that, that was what the the whole kind of you know pitch on their end was, um, and so it was mainly a it was like a partial cash transaction and then mainly stock transaction, um, so I had like a little bit of a you know like kind of like a nice annual bonus exit and then the rest was rolled as stock into the uh, the hold co when we uh, when we actually closed the deal, but before that there was a lot of back and forth where you know, they said the deal was gonna take three months, then it took six months. So you know, putting together the books and then a lot of stalling on their end. Um, it, it was really, really interesting. I learned a lot about private equity and, and finance in that, uh, in that deal. You know? And with the, the deal, did you stick around? Because it sounds like the way that it, those sort of end up is that 
maybe the company go, or the, the roll up goes public. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that people do it, but like, did you, did you have to stick around for a while? Did you replace yourself? How did that work? Yeah, so the deal initially was that I would uh, stick around as the uh, leader of this division, but the, um, the, the pitch that was given to me before the deal closed was not the same, was not the reality of what actually happened mm -hmm. after the deal closed. Uh, they, it was a little bit of a bait and switch to be, uh, to be honest with you. So that's why I, I ended up leaving a couple months after that to, to go out on my own again and, and do my own thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's usually how, how a lot of the unfortunate realities of, uh, behind the headline, um, there, there's a lot of issues, confusion, miscommunications, bait and switches. It just gets a little bit ugly sometimes, um, in, in the, in the trenches of it. But, uh, I guess once the, the, the deal went through, did you, how big was the team? I guess I didn't ask how big the team was when the transaction happened. Was it just so, you or it was, it was me and my wife that were working on it. And we also had a couple of freelancers that were helping us out with, um, just, you know, social media creative and, and yeah. just basic, like, you know, executive assistant type of tasks. Um, we definitely didn't have a big company. Like it wasn't a giant exit, um, but it was, uh, it was, you know, a decent size for what the company was doing at the time. Um, one of the big things that I learned from the exit is I would have, uh, launch more products. Like I said earlier, I would have launched more products online to have just more opportunities to cross sell before mm -hmm. scaling up through retail distribution because the overhead of retail is that you got to carry more inventory. And especially if you're selling in two different countries with different labeling requirements, that was, um, that was definitely a lesson learned, you know, is that there is a great value and sorry, maybe I'm jumping ahead to the end where like, it's kind of like takeaways and ideas and stuff. But one of the big things would have been like to have more focus at the start on nailing like one channel with one product and then expanding the products there first, you know? Mm. Well said. So let's talk about timing. I think, you know, a, a common question that I get and everybody's curious about is why was it the right time? I know that there's, everybody's different. Every business is different. People are in different chapters of their lives, but what type of tips could you share around when the right time to sell is? Oh, that's a good question. Um, for me, I knew it was time to sell because even just the thought of exiting and being able to move on to another business was more exciting than the thought of hundreds of thousands of dollars of extra investment to grow it. Mm. I wasn't as excited about the prospect of growing the business more than I was of washing my hands of it. And mm. I think that goes back to how I started the business is that it, it sounds very trite, um, but looking in, in hindsight, I always thought that people would say, oh, you, like, you got to start a, a business you're passionate about. I always thought that was kind of overplayed advice or kind of like too wishy-washy. Um, and that you know, sometimes you just got to be a shark and think about like, where can I make the most money? Mm -hmm. Personally, I, I think that you need to have at least some level of interest in the industry that you're in. And me, I, I just went about it like in a spreadsheet. It was like literally compound annual growth rate of industry, average gross margin, like recession resistance, like all these, I was super analytical about the industry. And the trade-off is that while I ended up in a good industry and it may, you know, it gave me a chance to get an exit, it wasn't an industry that, you know, when times were tough, it wasn't able to, like, I wasn't able to sustain myself on my passion for the, the people, the product, the industry, the change that we were having. And the crazy thing is our products were really good. We had great reviews. People were reordering. They were saying how the products were helping their pets live better lives. And like that in itself should be intr or extrinsically motivating, but I didn't find it after a certain period of time. It wasn't enough to sustain my, my desire to run the business. So I, I really learned like you got to have some kind of second order interest or, or connection to the industry, in my opinion, going forward, like just for me, maybe not everybody, but I would say that, that you know, that's how I knew it was time to sell was I just didn't want to keep doing the business versus getting out, you know? Yeah. And that, that definitely lands for sure. Cause I, I think everybody listening to this can, can resonate with, you know, even if there is a passion at the beginning, that fire kind of get is really big at the beginning. And then after just years of getting grinded <laughs> down, things going wrong constantly, even if things are going really well, you can just be exhausted and you can be tired. And that flame is much, much smaller towards that initial excitement and everything. And the type of individual that can take it zero to one to an exit often, in my experience, uh, needs to, to move on every you know few years. And I think that that's just the nature of the, of the, this whole startup world. So I'd like to just 
quickly talk about preparedness. I know Amazon is kind of a one-stop shop, but what tips can you share around preparing for an exit with your business? So the biggest thing during the discussions that came up was continuity, right? Having a plan for how are you going to replace yourself if you're, you're very involved in the business, mm -hmm. then you need to have, you know, some basic things documented. How do you source? How do you, how do you price? How do you do your new launches? All that. Just think of all the processes that you do and then get that down on paper. I mean, that's just the best practice in general. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing was obviously having good books and everything neatly organized. And I'm, I'm a very data driven person. So for me, when, when the private equity firm came to me with requests for, hey, what's your sales by region? What's the growth rate by region? All that, it was easy. Like I had spreadsheets with the raw data already. I just had to make um, charts for it and then present it like in a PowerPoint. So I say just having, making sure that you're collecting the data, even if you're not using it yet, collect data from day one on conversion rates and, and growth rates and every, every little piece of data that you can collect and just store it somewhere because you never know when you might need it to refer back to it. I was so happy at the end because I'd been tracking reorder rates by industry and by type of pet store. And I found that certain pet stores tended to reorder like five, ten, five times or six times more frequently than others. And like that helped us in the strategy for once the acquisition was done or before it to say, hey, like, as a, a growth strategy, I would focus marketing efforts on these types of stores because of that insight that I had. Mm. And demonstrating that you have a growth plan, that there is more growth to be had because no buyer wants to buy an asset without improving it, right? It's not like you're just gonna buy and, and sit on it and just collect the cash flows forever. Private equity wants to th think, how can I buy this and then grow the top line 30% more than it was before and then also cut expenses. So you have to have a clear vision on how you can achieve those things. Mm. Got it. So that takes us to the finale. Knowing what you know now, what would you tell John 10 years ago? I would tell John 10 years ago to, um, yeah, focus, focus at the start and um, build, like especially for branded products, I think that having more than one SKU is, uh, is critical and like expanding your SKUs before you expand channels. I think that's really critical. Um, and then also, you know, building relationships in your industry um, because, sorry, <laughs> just one second. Um, building relationships in your industry that can uh, lead to acquisition. So, you know, online business tends to be very isolating and it's really easy to just get caught in your own loop of, I'm just focusing on these you know, online campaigns, whatever. But I found that once I got out of the house and I went to these conferences, I was meeting all kinds of people that could help me and had different introductions. And there's a lot of people that aren't online or that don't spend a lot of time online. And so if you don't get out of the, get out of the house and go interact with them, you'll never meet them. And a lot of them are super powerful, helpful, kind, that can open all kinds of doors. Um, and then finally, yes, yeah, stick to what you're interested or passionate about in some way so that you can fuel yourself through the, the harder times. You know, those are kind of like the three takeaways that I've had. Mm. Yeah, fueling yourself through the harder times I feel like is such a key <laughs> key ingredient, uh, key ingredient. Cause that's part of it is just surviving, just making it through all the, the downs. It's just not quitting, you know, and, yeah, and you're going to have quitting. ups and downs in any business model. And I, I was listening to a podcast recently, this guy, um, Alex Homozi, he said, I, I love his stuff. He said, um, you know, you're going to be working 60 to 80 hours a week anyway, whether it's a restaurant or it's like a game changing, you know, software platform for all restaurants. So he said, you know, make sure you pick the right opportunity vehicle and something that you can sustain for a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I love that advice. It's, it's served me yeah. well. Yeah. Well, that leads us to today. What are you working on now and where can people learn more? Yeah. So aside from the e-commerce business, um, like I said, most of my professional career has been in uh, business to business technology, sales and marketing. So I've sold everything from like IT services to SaaS to sensors. And yeah, since uh, a few years, I've been consulting with people on how to grow their businesses. So I help uh, early stage B2B SaaS founders is kind of like my specific niche. I also do some service consulting, but mainly SaaS. And I help uh, B2B SaaS founders grow their, their revenues through uh, you know, personalized outbound, content marketing, pricing adjustments, and just like sales training and coaching for founders and early stage salespeople in the company. Right on. And where can people find more? They can find more info at 3victor.io or uh, on LinkedIn or YouTube and uh, Twitter. I'm active on uh, all three platforms. Very cool. Very cool. Well, wherever you guys are listening on iTunes or Spotify, the links that John mentioned will be in the show notes. But thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Really appreciate it.